what we had is five people on a volcano doing something that they'd never done before and it all fitted perfectly into place like Kaplunk. No one ever said, we can't do this. No one ever said, I don't want to get up today and go film it. I don't want to get up today and deliver these resources because it's why we were there. So we created over 30 hours worth of uh, usable materials for schools, hands-on stuff for science, uh, over 60 videos to go into them as well. So it seems that when you're picking an expedition team, you not only have to pick people that know what they're talking about, but also people that work really well together. So when picking the team for, for expedition at Etna, for the Antares trip that went down to Mount Etna, would spend four days in a car each way, spend five days on the mountain. Um, you really have to pick people that will get on with the, the task in hand without you giving them too much of a prod, uh, but will also have loads and loads of fun doing it as well. And on the trip, we had the most amazing time. And it's not the most important thing in the world to uh, have lots of fun and laugh all the time and, and that kind of stuff. But when you are having as much fun as we had on Expedition Etna, you can't help but share that passion with everyone else. I've always wanted to visit Mount Etna, so to have a chance to actually look at the sites behind it as well was even more exciting, so I couldn't say no. The best bit of the trip for me was actually seeing Mount Etna erupting. Uh, it was pretty amazing, because we were filming at the time, and then we just turned around and had a stark reminder of exactly where we were and what we were standing on. So I first got involved in Antares at the climbing wall at Boulders in Cardiff, talking to Hugh about some of his uh, slightly crazier ideas. And uh, this one was that he would go on expeditions and then take what he'd learned from them to schools, hopefully live while he was actually doing it. My day job is about communicating science to people of all ages, whether it's adults or the schools. And a lot of what we do is very direct. We go to them, we say, here's some science, here, have a look at it. And they see you as just a regular scientist in a white coat. So what he wanted to do was something that was very different and that you were coming at it from the angle of an adventurer and then getting across some of what scientists do in the field without having to talk about it as lab science, as real science, as something that's outside. I'm Tracy, I was doing all the biology resources while we were at Mount Etna. It was a really, really interesting trip. The way that it all panned out, it panned out perfectly. It was hard work, it was interesting, it was completely unexpected, but what we gained from it was, it was incredible. I didn't think we'd get so much from one trip. I couldn't believe the impact that Expedition Etna had on so many children. I mean, with Skype in the classroom involved, we were able to reach a whole year group and talk to them live from the volcano, which with all the feedback we got, it was incredible. They, they absolutely loved it. They found it so inspiring to be able to see us out there. And I don't think any of us were prepared for that. Neil, Suze, Tracy uh, and our man behind the camera and director, Joby Newson, were the perfect team to have because there was no, oh, you need to do this, you need to do that. It was all, we know what we need to do. We know that our task is to deliver these resources to the school students of the UK and the world. And this is why we're here. If we don't get to go climbing, uh, that's fine. We'll, we'll do the work in hand. If we don't get to eat tonight or go to bed till four in the morning, 
we'll do the work because it's what we're here to do and it's why the Antares team will stay that team for um, the next expedition and the expedition is down the line because they are dedicated people and they're people who will give their time and dedication uh, for the cause. achievement uh, in the whole trip was actually taking part in a little hike that we did along a ridge in the Alps. I'm terrified of heights and to be able to do that was kind of amazing. Something that's really unexpected about this point is that it's actually on the meridian line, the first meridian line from the prime meridian. The prime meridian is a vertical line, a north-south line that goes over the earth that goes through Greenwich in London. The line here is the first line past that, so it's a 15 degrees because the earth is split into 24 little slots of time zones. And it's just a big coincidence that it happens to pass right the way through the centre of Mount Etna. that we've noticed only because the roof is sticking out of what was a massive lava flow. So we've done a bit of research and this house was actually buried in the 1983 lava flow from Mount Etna just up there. And as you can see the lava came pretty high considering this is the upstairs and this is the roof. There was a downstairs section as well. Now there's a really nice story that goes with this house and its burial. Although it sounds a little bit morbid the guy that owns this house knew the lava was coming, owing to the fact that Mount Etna's eruptions produce incredibly dense lava that's very slow moving. And because of that, he prepared a whole feast to welcome Mama Etna and, uh, and let her engulf his home. So although it sounds pretty tragic, luckily he managed to escape, but it just goes to show the destructive power of this lava. to about 3,000 meters on Etna and currently we're in one of the uh, the craters on the southeast side and we found while shooting uh, some other stuff that our feet are actually getting quite warm and it's nice to have warm feet but if you lean down and put your hands on the ground you can feel that the ground is actually warm and what you get is uh, big outpourings of, of steam and, and gas out of the, the, the craters, out of the vents. Um, and actually it'll come up all through the, uh, the rock as well. So it gets nice and warm, nice and toasty. Um, not great for your, your shoes, but it is good for toasty feet. 
the other side of it was seeing my own body fail on me. Um, I class myself as a physical person. The thought of walking up a volcano was, that was amazing. I was quite happy doing that. But once we got to the top and then it was, right, okay, let's get filming, let's do the work. The altitude really, really affected me. Suddenly I couldn't get my words out. I couldn't concentrate. I couldn't, I couldn't think straight. Okay guys, I hope you enjoyed your activity. I hope you learned a lot about how many, how... Hi guys, I hope you enjoyed your activity. I hope it helped to find out, helped you understand. Okay. Hi guys, I hope you enjoyed your activity. Hopefully you should have, hopefully you should have, shut up Trace. Screw it. And it's all down to the fact of going from sea level and within two hours, we were up at 3000 meters. And 3,000 metres isn't that high for altitude to affect you, but when you do it that quick, your body finds it hard to adjust, and I wasn't expecting it, I wasn't ready for it. Why are STEM subjects really important to us? Well, it's, it's kind of hard to answer, but also quite easy to answer as well. Um, STEM subjects are some of the most important subjects in the world because it, they create the world around us. So everything you see from the, the pencil you write with to the, the power station that generates our electricity is made by people who studied STEM in the past. I've always said that a scientist or an engineer isn't what you do, it's not your job, it's not your degree. It's the way that you think, and I currently think like a scientist, so I am a scientist and forever will be a scientist. And if we can encourage students to think like scientists and engineers for that much longer, uh, then the world will be literally a brighter place.